Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Adam Hadley from uh, NHS Digital, who is going to talk about the different designs of sharing platforms and the RESTful API future. So can we all welcome Adam to the stage? Thank you. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so we've heard quite a lot uh, so far about information models, messaging, the importance of designing services and information. Um, and they're all vital parts of coming up with a, a way of sharing information. Um, but there are a few other aspects that I wanted to sort of touch upon in this, in this next talk about information sharing and what, what, what some of the other pieces you need to, to, to put in place to make that work. Um, so I want to start by talking about some of the different approaches and patterns. We've heard a bit about messaging, which is one way of sending information from one place to another. But there are, are other approaches, and I'm going to run through a few of those. I'll touch on a build on a little bit more what, what, what Matt was just saying around APIs and some of the different types of APIs. And then importantly, um, APIs and information models um, and even patterns aren't enough. You do st still also need some other underpinning technical um, capabilities um, within either platform or systems to, to make that stuff work. And I'm going to cover a bit of what, what those are as well. Um, and finally, I'll talk a bit about this, this, this buzzword platforms as well and, wh and what that actually means and, and some of the considerations about that. Um, so just to run through a few patterns or approaches, so I use the word pattern. When I say pattern, I really just mean different ways of solving a particular problem. In this case, the problem of sharing of information. Um, so one really simple one, um, which, which you know, you'll be familiar with, is just having the same system. So you can share information quite effectively by all using the same system. Right? And that, you'll have seen that. So if you've used Lorenzo or System One or Emis, or a, a lot of those systems allow the same system to be used by a number of different services and information to be shared within that system. And that works very well because you don't have to worry about differing information models because it's all in the same system. It can provide functionality specific to various care settings. But typically, you'll reach a point where there'll be another service, say social care, where it, they just don't want to use that system. Or equally, you might not want to be tied into using one system because you, you, you're then at the behest of that one supplier of that system. So there's generally going to be a point at which you realize that, that you can't scale that uh, to solve all of your sharing problems, although it shouldn't be ruled out as a way of solving some of them. Um, so other, other approaches, other quite simple ones. Um, quite often, you'll see uh, this approach used, and, and this, I used the phrase click through, but basically what it means is you're logged into one system, you're looking at a patient's record, and you're provided with a way of clicking a button which transfers you into some other system, uh, so you can see that same patient record, usually passing through some information about the patient you were looking at and who you are. Um, so this isn't really integra integration, it's not integrating any of that information, and the information is flowing back from system B in this example into system A, but from a user perspective, they can potentially click through and around between different systems and get the information they need that way. Um, <coughs> some of the problems, obviously, as I mentioned, the information is not going back. So if you can't get to that system for some reason, um, you don't have that information. Quite often, uh, it's quite tricky to make it work so that it looks consistent. And you might have to then have lots of logins for different systems. So there's some challenges and other things you have to put in place to make that work, if that's a, but it. But it's used in quite a lot of um, systems today quite successfully as a way of easily sharing information at a human level without worrying about information models or, or some of the other things we've talked about. Um, the next one, which goes back to some of the, the examples that Matt was giving, is around sending information point to point. So uh, a good example of this would be, um, as we heard earlier, sending a discharge summary. So if you're in a, a hospital, you create a summary of the uh, encounter that that patient's had in the hospital. You package it up in some way, usually in the form of a document, and you send it to a GP or possibly some other recipients. Um, but you know who you need to send it to, and you just send it to them. So you made a decision. Um, so you do have to start worrying there about the information models and consistency and coding, potentially. <coughs> um, uh, and, it, and it's very good if it mean, because it means you know who it's going to. You know, potentially you can figure out, you know whether it's got there. Um, if that person has to have a copy of that, absolutely for legal reasons, for example, then it's absolutely the best way of getting it there. Um, but again, there's limitations. For a start, I need to know who to send it to, and, and, and that may not always be the case. Also, when I'm sending information to someone else, I am, by definition, duplicating that information. So we now have the same information in more than one place. And that might be fine, because if it's just a, a document summarizing an encounter that's happened, that's not going to change. So um, it's fine that that's a, there's a copy of that somewhere else. But if that was a care plan, for example, that I'd sent across, 
well, what if, if I want to now make changes to it because I've had another encounter? And what if the person on the other end wants to make changes to it? They get out of sync. You've got to figure out how do I keep these things up to date. So it doesn't lend itself well to some of those other types of sharing problems. Um, and also, it relies on you knowing in advance who's going to need the information. So if this is an A&E a a &E that needs information about you, they won't, nobody would have known to have sent it to you beforehand. So it, it doesn't solve all of those types of scenarios. <coughs> uh, another another uh, phrase you will probably have come across um, when, when looking at these kinds of things is <coughs> portals. So a portal is uh, a way of bringing together a view of a set of information in a single place. Normally some kind of web-based system that you log into, um, and then it can go off and, and retrieve information from a number of other systems, bring together a kind of consistent view for you. Um, quite often used within um, hospitals or within small local communities to bring information together in a nice co consistent way. Again, it's not really bringing, it's not, not, none of the information is actually being integrated between systems. So it, 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 so it potentially alleviates some of the challenges around uh, the modeling. Um, but equally, it, it, it quite often provides you with a read-only view. It's quite, quite often tricky to then make changes to that information. <coughs> um, and again, it's limited because um, <clears throat> the portal needs to know about how to talk to all those other systems. And that's probably fine when you've got a fairly small number of systems. But if you wanted to be able to access information from a whole range of different organizations, you're very quickly going to reach the limits of what you can achieve through a portal, integrating with lots and lots of systems individually. So that moves us on to some of the other, some of the other patterns that I'm going to cover briefly. So all those are about pushing information out or making it visible to a human. Some of the other approaches that, that have been uh, used quite successfully in some scenarios are approaches like having a shared repository. So um, <clears throat> in this example, we've got uh, one or more systems capturing information, maybe documents, but it doesn't have to be documents. It could be individual resources or pieces of information about a patient. And all of those producers of information put them into a central place, some kind of central repository or document store, um, and make it available in that way to anyone else who then needs it in future. So this is much more of a pull type approach. So I can, if, I'm a, if I need, if, if I'm, for example, in unscheduled care, if I need to go and find out some information, I've got a single place that I can go to, and all of the contributors have put their information in there, and I can just go and pull it out when I need it. Um, so it's quite a different approach. It's kind of moving away from pushing information to people you know are going to need it to putting it somewhere that people can get to when they, when, whenever they need it. Um, <clears throat> uh, th there's a good examples of this. You, you'll have seen, you'll uh, no doubt have heard of several examples of this kind of approach. So things like the Hampshire Health Record or the Leeds Care Record. Um, uh, so there's lots of examples around, and there's even national examples. So PDS, um, the P Person Demographic Service, Summary Care Record are national examples of a shared repository. Uh, pattern. Um, there's kind of an evolution of this pattern though, which is called the registry repository pattern. And, and what this does is it, it recognizes that there's probably never going to be one repository that everyone's going to use. Um, so if we accept that there's not going to be one repository and that there's going to be probably different repositories for different types of information or for different lo um, localities or areas of the country, then we need to think about, well, how do we find where all that information is? So the registry repository pattern separates out the repository from the index of the information that are in the, the, the various repositories. So it provides this extra component called a registry or an index, um, which is literally just that. It's an index. You can think of it a bit like a Google search index, which you, you can search and query, and then it will give you pointers to where that information is. So Google doesn't hold the information about all the web pages on the internet. It just holds pointers to them that you can search, and then it gives you a link to go and get the information. So, so this is exactly that pattern. So the, the registry is something you query to find out where the information is, and then you can go to whichever the repository is that holds that information to go and get it. So this, um, it, it, again, there's examples of this, and there's existing standards. So if you've come across standards like XDS, um, that's an example of a standard for this, this kind of approach. Um, it's used quite heavily for things like radiology images and, and so on. Um, and also we're looking at nationally within NHS Digital uh, at some kind of early thinking around what a national registry might look like. It's still very early days, but um, that's something to, to keep an eye on um, going forward. Um, so there's a whole set of patterns there. Well, one more. Um, the final one, um, which is uh, quite topical at the moment for, for some of the, the pieces of work that I'm involved with, is the publish subscribe pattern. So slightly different in that this is more event-based, so to, to Matt's point, where you have, rather than 
focusing on shifting data around per se, there's quite often cases where you just want to know when something's happened. So if you want to know when a patient that you're responsible for gets admitted to hospital, you just want to know when they've been admitted to hospital. Um, so quite often there's a, a, there's a need to be able to send events or notifications or alerts or that kind of thing around the system. So publish subscribe is a way of achieving that. And the important aspect of this is you've got somebody generating some kind of event, so a hospital uh, creating an event to say this patient's been admitted uh, or, or an event to say uh, a new baby's been born or somebody's died or somebody's had an immunization or whatever the event is. The, the, the originator of that event can push it into some kind of central event hub and then other other organizations or systems can then register the types of events that they want to know about. Um, so they can create a subscription to say, um, I'm a GP practice, so I want to know about any of the patients that, I'm, that are registered with me who get admitted to hospital, and I want to be notified immediately, for example. You probably don't, but for example. Um, so you could register that as a subscription here, and then when the hospital generates the event, they push it into that hub. They don't need to know who's interested in that event. They just need to know, I've got an event that somebody's going to be interested in, so I'm going to publish it into that hub. And that hub can look through those subscriptions to, to establish who, who, who wants to know that, who needs to know that that person's been admitted. And then based on those subscriptions, it can then send those events out to the relevant subscribers. So it's quite a powerful pattern because it means that the subscribers don't need to know where all the events come from and the event sources don't need to know who all the subscribers are. So it's a very flexible way of allowing events to flow around to wherever they're needed without everyone having to know in advance who's going to need them. Um, so that's a set of patterns. Um, there are others, then, um, but, but that's a, a, a good kind of high-level starter list. Um, so hopefully you can start to see it's a, little bit, it's a little bit more complex than just sending a message. There's several different ways of getting information to flow around the service. But you know, there's, they've all got lines that go between them, so there are messages involved. The question you're probably thinking now is, well, well which is the right one then? Tell us what the answer is. I quite often get asked that. Which, which one is the right pattern? And I'm afraid you're probably not going to be surprised to hear that there isn't one answer to that question because it really depends on the, the problem you're trying to solve. So it goes back to the service design point that Matt was making. You need to understand the problem, the nature of the information sharing that's required to be able to pick the pattern that best suits. And in practice, most um, health systems out there, most localities, regions, are going to use a whole range of those patterns and probably all of those patterns um, because each one fits a different particular need. And they're not mutually exclusive. You're going to want, in some cases, to be able to send a document to someone and you, in other cases, you're going to be able to go and find information when you need it. Um, so there's no one size fits all. You need to understand the characteristics of the sharing you're trying to do. Um, you need to understand the scale of the sharing you're trying to do to understand whether that pattern's going to scale to, to cope with that requirement. And importantly, look also at the, the landscape that you've got in, within the various systems you've already got, um, because you'll probably find a lot of these capabilities are already there um, and you can build on. Um, and you're not going to start ripping stuff out and trying to just put in one pattern solution that's going to solve everything. So you really need to build up based on what you've got, where the information is, and start to introduce some of the more mature patterns as, as you need them to solve the problems that you've got. Um, some of these patterns need other technical capabilities to underpin them, and that's what I'm going to come on to a minute, in a minute. Um, before I do, though, the, some of those earlier patterns I mentioned have some similar limitations, and it's what I like to call the n times n minus 1 over 2 problem. I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, also known as spaghetti, which is that you know, every, every sender of information needs to know about every receiver um, for it to work. So being able to send point to point, I need to know all the places I could send to, and I need to have agreed with all of those places, the type of thing I'm going to send, what, to, what they're going to expect, and it's just not going to scale necessarily um, for a lot of the problems that you're going to want to try and solve. Um, so that's why some of those push patterns aren't always appropriate, uh, and some of those other, other patterns might be a better fit where you're wanting to share in much bigger scales. Um, so that, that move from push to pull is, is, is an important consideration when you're starting to look at larger scale sharing across regions or even nationally. Um, and you might want to start looking at some of those other more mature patterns. Um, but as I said, all of these things have arrows. And, it, and especially when you're starting to move towards pulling information on demand, that requires that the, the places you want to pull from have the ability for you to go and pull them. So that then brings us back to this, this, this acronym APIs. Um, so I thought I'd just quickly reiterate and build a bit on what Matt said around APIs and what they are um, and the types of APIs, um, just to kind of build on that a bit. So an API is a formal contract between two systems for how information can be shared uh, or retrieved from, from another system. Um, so it, it's, it's the formal definition of 
if you want to go and get information from there, here's what you need to give me, here's the information I need, here's the prerequisites, you've got to have gone and verified the identity of that person first before you can call this API, because I'm going to trust that that identity is who you say it is, for example, and here's the sorts of things that could go wrong, the kinds of areas to expect if I don't know who that person is you're asking for, and here's exactly what you're going to get back, um, all linked in with the information modeling that we talked about and so on. Um, and there's a few different types of APIs. We talked a bit about messaging and the event-based stuff. Um, I've kind of broken it into three broad categorizations. Um, I'm sure other people would come up with different ones, but for now, um, broadly, there's the kind of remote procedure call type of API. So this is where I've got a system and I want to call a piece of functionality that's been done by someone else. So it's not about data per se, it's about I want to book an appointment, so I'm going to call a, an appointment booking API. Uh, so it's a piece of functionality that I'm expecting from that other system. And that, that other system might have to do all sorts of things and, and access various bits of data, um, mark books as slot, confirm availabilities, trigger letters to be sent to the patient in the post. So there's a whole set of behaviours that I'm expecting that other system to do for me when I make that procedure call. Um, so that's, that's one type of, of API where it's functionality kind of based. Then you've got kind of the more messaging and event-based uh, things that, for example, Matt was talking about, where you have a, a, a document or a chunk of information that you want to package up and send to someone, and typically there's some kind of implied behavior expected at the other end. So when you send a document to a GP, you probably expect them to do something with it. And then finally, the, what, what people quite often are talking about nowadays when they, when they say APIs is RESTful APIs. I, I was going to talk a little bit more about REST, but I'm not going to have time to explain it in a lot of detail. But um, and, and this probably will come out more in the next lecture around fire anyway, but it's really, it's focusing in on the data and it's focusing in on those small chunks of data or resources and the basic kind of operations you would want to do on that, that data. So create, read, update, delete, search, the basic kind of data-centric operations on those chunks of information. So it's not focused on providing functionality per se, it's more about the information, the data, the information, um, and, and by providing that information in that way, the idea is that it can then be used for a whole range of different things. It's not constrained to uh, calling a function to do something. You can use that information to do all, all manner of different uh, business processes and support a number of different um, scenarios. Um, so that's a bit more about APIs. The, 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 other, the next thing I wanted to talk a bit about, and I alluded to this earlier, is it's great having all these different patterns, um, and it's we, we absolutely have got to understand the information models and the the content and the data and all and, and all that, that good stuff. We've got to understand the business aspects, um, but we also need to have some other underpinning things that are common as well, not just data models, um, but also some other capabilities. Um, so I'm going to go through a few uh, in, in the next few slides. These are kind of logical things. Um, they're not systems, so I've drawn them as different boxes, but that doesn't mean they're all different systems, so don't read them like that. These are just things that one or more systems need to do consistently um, from a technical perspective to allow these various patterns to work and the information to flow. Um, and you don't necessarily need all of these, but this is kind of a, a, a kind of high-level run-through of the types of things you're going to need to consider. And some of these we do have national components that can do some of, so I'll try and highlight those as we go through. Um, so the first thing you need, probably quite obviously, um, is you need some kind of connectivity between two systems that you want to be able to interoperate. So there's got to be a network of some kind. Normally that's either the internet or N3 today. Um, going forward, N3 will be replaced by HSCN, so it'll be whatever that ends up being, and that may evolve into just being the internet as well. So, you, But you need some connectivity, um, and you need a way of securing that and trusting it. Um, the spaghetti problem, you can you can alleviate some degree by using brokers, middleware, integration engines, and that kind of thing. So that's another thing to consider. Um, so that gives you the, the, the transport, the, the wires. Um, another thing you really need um, is you need some consistent way of managing identity. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's all well me sending a message about a particular patient to someone, but unless you've got a consistent way of identifying that that patient is the same patient that the person who sent it thinks it is, it's not going to work. So you need a consistent way of identifying patients uh, and we have a national solution for that, which is PDS, which is the Person, uh, person Demographic Service. Um, uh, but there are also local solutions for some of that in some cases. Uh, as we look forward to apps and, and looking at Michael's story, looking at apps, we need a way of identifying that that, that, is, the, that is Michael using his app and not somebody else. So we need a way of identifying um, 
citizens as well for accessing these kinds of services because they might be one of those two systems in that picture. We also need to be able to identify other things like the organisations that it's coming from and to because we need to know it's not coming from some unknown organisation in some other country. We need to know that who, these, who the organisations involved are and, and the people. Um, so where, where that's not a citizen, that might be a member of staff. So we need to know, is it appropriate for that member of staff to be sending that information? Do we know who that is? If I'm identifying a particular clinician, um, is that, does, does the other system need to be able to uh, know who that clinician is and find out? So there's some identity kind of related capabilities there that you need to consider. The next one is discovery. So it's all very well saying system A sends something to system B, but how does system A know wh which system B is and how to get to system B? So you need some way of, uh, I've called it endpoint directory in here, but you need some way of identifying the various places that you can send things to. And so it's typically going to be linked back to your organization directory because you might want to say, I know I need to send this to that organization, but there's 50 systems in that organization. So I need a way of identifying which the right address to send it to is, which system it's going to go to. So I need some kind of director or way of discovering those endpoints that I can send things to. Um, I talked about the uh, registry repository pattern. So uh, equally, I might want to go and find information about a particular patient. So to be able to discover that, the registry capability is on here, which you saw on that pattern. So that's the index of where the information is to begin with. So I know where to go and try and find it. Um, security, always important. So we need to make sure that you know the care record guarantee is honored and that, that only appropriate people can access information. So we need authentication. We need a, a standard way that, that is trusted by both parties of knowing who's accessing the information and role-based access controls and all the other um, associated controls that you would need around the people using this these, these systems. Um, and equally, you, you need to have some kind of trust between the two systems so that they can have a secure communication between the two. They can encrypt the messages and so on. So something like a public key infrastructure type capability. Um, to allow that encryption to happen. Uh, messaging, I won't dwell on because that's kind of the main topic of most of the other talks is around the standards and the APIs for the actual content itself and the reference data and terminologies and so on to underpin that. So that's another key capability. Um, notifications, I talked about PubSub. You're probably going to want some kind of subscription capability to be able to uh, identify who needs to be notified of various things. So that's another one. And then there's some other IG ones. Everyone loves IG. Um, Legitimate relationships, so how do you know that that person that I'm going to send it to has a relationship with that patient? Or do I need to know? If I do, then I need a way of doing it. Um, how, do I, how do I know whether they've consented or dissented to that information being shared? How do I know there's a data sharing ag agreement in place between those two organizations? So there's some kinds of capabilities needed there. Um, and just to reiterate, these are not all systems. They're all just capabilities that might just exist in the systems you already have, but you need to have understand how they're being done consistently between the parties that are interoperating for it to work. Um, so unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as just having a consistent information model. You also need to understand how some or, some or all of these are also done in a consistent way to allow these information flows to actually work. Um, so finally, platforms. One of, the, yeah, one of the ways of making sure that you have consistent approach to some of those capabilities is to use some kind of common platform to provide those capabilities for you. Quite logical. So you might say, well, within a particular area, we need to know who everybody is, so we'll have a consistent single place where everyone is authenticated, um, so a single user directory for all users in our area. Um, and that means we, everyone uses that, and they all know that that's a trusted way of identifying the, the users involved in these information flows. So that might be an example. So, and, and to take an example of the one on here, so if I want to send a discharge summary from uh, a hospital to a GP, um, I need to be able to identify the, the patient consistently. So hopefully you'd use PDS for that. I need to identify the organization I'm sending it to. I need to Id locate the endpoint to send it to. I need to encrypt it. Um, so you could, you could use a single platform, either a national platform or a regional platform or even local platforms. It really depends on the scale of the sharing that you need to do for the particular problem you're trying to solve. Um, some considerations though when you're looking at platforms. There are lots of vendors who will sell you interoperability solutions and going back to Matt's slide, there's lots of things you can buy that will do interoperability for you, but you really do need to understand what those capabilities are you, you need and make sure that the platform is giving you the capabilities you need in a way that's going to work for you. There are proprietary platforms out there you could, you could buy. I'm not. Uh, I say, I say it often, that's probably a bit harsh, but there are proprietary solutions you can buy into. I mean, if you imagine you're 
If you've got an iPhone or an Apple device, you'll be familiar with the fact that it only talks to other Apple devices. It's quite a closed ecosystem. Um, uh, so that's something to bear in mind. That might be fine if, if everyone else in that, in, that you need to share information with is buying into that same ecosystem. Um, but you may also want to look at some more open standards, and that's one of the themes of some of these talks, uh, to make sure that you're not kind of stuck in that kind of walled garden approach. And there are standards that we're talking about over, the, over these, uh, few, these two days around things like fire um, and, and so on, which can help with that. Uh, a hot topic, federated capabilities. Some capabilities you can kind of link the various platforms together. So you can kind of, so identity is a good example. You could say, well, we've got a national way of identifying people with smart cards. Uh, we've got projects ongoing to remove the need for smart cards and make that much easier. Um, but we've also got you know, a Manchester ID in our Manchester care record and a, you know, a, um, a GP ID in our GP system. Why can't we use them and, and log in with that and then get access to national systems? And, and there are standards that would allow that to work, that allow the various providers of that capability to trust each other and exchange identities. Um, but it's quite difficult to do in practice. Um, with identity, it's quite mature. There's quite good mature standards for that. Um, so it's actually not that hard. Um, it's not easy, but it's not that hard. But for some of the other capabilities I talked about there, it is a lot more difficult. And, and, and a lot of them, there isn't standards that will allow you to do that easily today. Um, so that's something that, I think going forward over the next few years, we're going to need to work on making sure that those standards get developed so that we can link together national capabilities with regional capabilities with local capabilities. Um, but it, 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 it sounds easy on paper, but it's not in practice, I suppose, is what I'm saying there. Um, and, and as I said, there are some things nationally that, that have been done and that we are still working on and building new capabilities. Um, I mentioned PubSub, for example. We're doing work with the Child Health Program around some, some uh, publish, subscribe uh, solution for child health events to help track children across the service. Um, so there's all sorts of work going on, on on that, which is worth being aware of and, and seeing whether you can factor that into whatever you do around platforms and sharing patterns. Um, so to summarize, um, there's a whole range of different approaches, patterns for, for, for delivering the various requirements you have for sharing of information. Um, there's various different types of APIs, and APIs are not all alike, so it's worth understanding that and, and understanding which is the most appropriate for the problem you're trying to solve. Um, but importantly, just having APIs and standards is not enough. You do also need to think about those other underpinning capabilities. You can't escape IG, it exists. You do have to think about it, sadly. Um, a, a, and understanding what you could do to try and bring together a consistent approach for delivery of those other capabilities as well. Um, and, and leverage existing platforms wherever you can, understand what's already in your environment and try and build on that. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you. Okay. That, hello. That was brilliant, Adam. I mean, just to be able to distill the complexity of healthcare informatics in the way that you two have done is brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, I guess what it also points out to is what fantastic, great, talented people we have in the UK. You know, we really need to use our resource of talent that we have to make a difference.